Hi, I'm Arthur Rasmussen. Uh, I'm the co-author on a piece of software called LibVFIO. Uh, we presented this talk a short time earlier at XDC uh, 2021. It's the Xorg Developer Conference. Uh, but unfortunately, we had a few problems with our audio. So what I have just done here is I've uh, put together just a little re-recording. Um, so hopefully, we don't have any issues in terms of uh, the audio with this. So what I'll do first is I'm going to share uh, my screen. So I have some slides here that we'll give very quickly right before we run through our demo. Yep. So uh, we're our compute. We work at a company here in Toronto. Uh, our business primarily does uh, virtual private server uh, VPS stuff. So we do particularly uh, GPU accelerated uh, virtual private server stuff. Uh, and what we have decided to do uh, as of a few months ago is to make uh, a large portion of our software uh, open source. So what we're doing today is we are uh, looking at some of these problems uh, and we're thinking about how can we help not just address these problems for ourselves, uh, but address these problems hopefully in a way that is uh, you know, more for the general benefit of users who have felt some of these pain points uh, like ourselves. So the issue that we see in many cases is that, uh, you know, if you're a user of a graphics card, if you want to run uh, a Linux operating system uh, on your host, you end up in a situation where, you know, a lot of people will buy a really good computer, uh, they'll get a good graphics card and they'll think, hey, I wanna play my games. And, you know, it, those games don't work on Linux. Uh, or if they do work on Linux, you know, they don't work great or, or there's, you know, questions around compatibility when new games come out uh, and a large, a lot of people who would run Linux, uh, they just end up running uh, Windows because it's kind of the de facto, you know, everything will work. Uh, that's kind of, you know, the story. So unfortunately, if you do want to do any kind of graphics sharing functionality where you take uh, the drivers for your graphics card and you run them inside of a virtual machine and in the host system at the same time, Really, what you'll end up with, or what you're left with, is, uh, you know, you can either work with something like AMD GIM. Uh, so this is their GPU IOB module, which is unfortunately not a great experience on most hardware. Uh, or you can run NVIDIA Grid, uh, which is of course, you know, locked to very expensive hardware, uh, the data center cards, and you have to pay monthly in order to use it. So this is out of reach for the vast majority of people. Uh, at the same time, uh, because of this functionality being sort of locked out. Uh, the opportunity to load balance GPU workloads, uh, it's simply not in modern operating systems. People aren't creating uh, functionality to look at the resources or the scheduling time uh, of the GPU, uh, you know, or the, uh, let's say, allocation of memory. Uh, and they're not really able to do a lot of things that you are able to do with uh, mediated device drivers where you can lock uh, certain address ranges to certain virtual functions uh, and you can control the scheduling um, with a great deal of granularity. So with those problems in mind, we put together uh, some solutions for that. So the two pieces of software that we're making available today uh, are libvfio uh, and the program that integrates that library, uh, which is what we're calling Hyperborea. So libvfio has enabled us uh, at our compute to do industry best dedicated VPS prices for GPU compute. Uh, we've got what we think is some of the most aggressive pricing uh, on GPU uh, in the world, especially in uh, dedicated virtual private servers. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I think I left in there, this is a slide from another presentation, is uh, that we do have a dedicated support team. But uh, for LibVFIO and Hyperborea in general, uh, we are enabling sort of this ability to do uh, GPU multi-tenancy features, uh, creating virtual machines, sharing it between the host and the guest systems. Uh, it's all very, you know, sort of seamless uh, piece of software. It sort of integrates that all in one uh, component, uh, and it automates the creation of the vGPUs uh, when we're, you know, creating new VMs. Uh, it automates the pairing of it, uh, and it sort of auto load balances a lot of that sort of stuff. Uh, today, one of the things uh, that we're making available in the open sources is actually the ability to use this capability on, um, in, you know, all consumer or most uh, consumer NVIDIA cards. Uh, so. What I'm going to present in a moment, what I'm going to show in a moment is actually a, an example of something that's running on an NVIDIA consumer card. Uh, as well, we're supporting a limited number of AMD GPU devices. Uh, so devices that we have in consumer contexts uh, been able to hack. So for example, this um, 
if you're an enthusiast of LibBFIO, you might know this. Uh, it's been possible for a little while to hack the W7100 cards uh, from uh, AMD uh, to enable uh, the vGPU functionality uh, if you'd like to work with that. So that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is working with uh, the Intel uh, DG series cards. So this card in particular, uh, this is the Intel DG1. Uh, they are now you know, marketing their Intel Arc GPUs. Uh, that in particular with the Arc GPU uh, is sort of intended to be a version of the graphics card that has none of the sort of market segmentation uh, for this virtual GPU type of uh, functionality. So if the very low end, this was a card that we harvested out of a 500 or $700 all in uh, machine, we're able to get this graphics card out. And this uh, GPU is able to create the uh, vGPU stuff. So the virtual functions that are necessary to forward to the VMs, uh, even at the lowest price point. So the very, very low end part, and that's gonna apply through the mid end and the high end parts as well. So there's no uh, real fragmentation in the availability of those APIs through the Intel parts. So that uh, that is very exciting. So we're supporting now today uh, those devices uh, and uh, the tools in order to actually launch a virtual machine with that are going to be available at libvf.io, uh, which you can see the link uh, for at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so this uh, work, uh, I have to be clear about all this. Uh, I am standing uh, on the shoulders of giants, uh, working with really awesome people. Uh, so I can't take credit really at all for a lot of this stuff. The building blocks are there. I'm just kind of gluing things together. So Wendell Wilson uh, is somebody I really have a lot to, uh, somebody who I owe a lot to. Uh, so he has encouraged me uh, through career changes, our career direction changes. He's encouraged me and helped me, uh, you know, at least in the area uh, where we share some common interests, which is in this VFIO stuff. And he certainly has uh, you know, caused the community to explode through his work. Uh, and in our personal interactions, he's uh, been very helpful for me as well in a whole variety of different contexts. Uh, Jeffrey uh, McRae Gniff, he is, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, the authority on this subject in a lot of different places. He's written really excellent tools uh, like Looking Glass, which we're gonna have a look at in a moment, which is running behind me. Uh, and he's also written some excellent blog posts and forum posts on the subject of virtual GPUs uh, and how exactly to use them. Uh, so Michael Buchel, he's the co-author of uh, LibVFIO with me. He's also responsible for refactoring a lot of uh, very cringy, uh, sometimes not functional code uh, that I've written. Uh, and you know he'll often go back, fix some of those code quality issues up before we go and release them as open source. Uh, James Borst, he is... Uh, an advisor to us. He's been extremely helpful uh, throughout our business. We wouldn't be here without him. Uh, Shervin is one of our software developers uh, who's working on some of our web stack stuff. Um, Sander, who's also uh, helping to work with uh, LibVFIO, also extremely helpful. So that is the uh, slide. So now that we're done with that, I am going to just exit out quickly uh, and we will we'll resume with the uh, demo. So what you can see running behind me is a uh, graphic system uh, that's actually running on a single graphics card. Uh, so this, I can show you really quickly. So this machine, it has a single graphics card. So that single graphics card, the resources that it's using are actually being shared between a virtual machine and the host system at the same time. Uh, and the creation and the management of the uh, vGPU uh, interfaces, so the virtual functions, uh, the parsing of the IO MMU groups, uh, the pairing of the virtual function to the virtual machine, all of that is handled uh, by libvfio. So what I'll do here is I'll actually show, uh, we can shut this VM down, we'll reboot it. And you can actually see in real time us sort of going through and making that work. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to purge all of the actively running VMs. And then what I'm going to do is restart it. So while we're doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run a host graphics program. So in this case, this is um, a Tux Racer, which is you know 
uh, one of the better games on Linux uh, for graphics programs. So while that's running, you can actually see uh, the resources being used by the host. Uh, and as you can see over here, what we've done is we've gone through, uh, you can't really see it because the text scrolls too quickly. Uh, this is parsing the IO MMU groups. Uh, then from the parsed IO MMU groups, it's going and it's targeting a particular device. Uh, when it finds the device that it's going to target, what it then does is it creates a mediated uh, device. That mediated device, uh, what then happens is that it's bound to a VFIO uh, driver, uh, which essentially keeps it from being initialized by the host. Then it's automatically paired to a guest operating system. Uh, and then that guest operating system, it goes in and it spawns up. So right now we're actually copying a file uh, from a base image. So that base image is like a, a virtual machine image that is um, essentially like a template. So when the template clone is finished, which you can see it is just finished, it's booting up the virtual machine uh, with that mediated device driver attached to it. Uh, and then as you'll see right here, uh, what we're doing is we're using Looking Glass, which is that project from GNIF. Uh, so he is doing here a, uh, whoops, clicked the wrong link there. This is a, uh, a technique for doing copyless uh, DMA transfer of frames uh, between the guest operating system and the host operating system. So it's extremely low latency graphics drawing. So the whole point of this is that if we actually look here, you can see this is running at about 200 frames a second. Uh, while we are running, uh, you know, resources on the host operating system uh, and you know the guest operating system at the same time, so it's able to do the VFIO sharing in the same kind of sense that you would think uh, if you're getting a separate graphics card and passing that in, which is kind of the traditional way uh, to do VFIO. But at the same exact time, what it's uh, what it's able to do is able to use the same resources uh, for the host operating system. Uh, without necessarily requiring uh, that wholly dedicated card. So now that that uh, is running, just to kind of show you, Let's see if I can get out of that. So this is in fact interactive. So you can see it's sort of working, yeah, no problem at all. Uh, and as far as the uh, performance of this, you know, this can handle stuff, uh, you know, 4K graphics can handle, you know, 60, 90, 120 frames a second, no problem at all. Uh, and the latencies are, you know, they're unnoticeable. They're so low that it really feels like a native experience. So the what this is meant to address uh, is not just needs in the context of uh, the server, which is where we initially went and wrote this technology for. It's meant to address some of the concerns that people have when they're running uh, virtual machines uh, at home or when they're thinking about how they're going to run their applications at home uh, and making a decision about which operating system to choose. So with these tools uh, all combined together, uh, utilized by libvfio, you can feel empowered today without a lot of work to go home and to create uh, a virtual machine which has the same kind of performance that you would expect from a native system. So the idea is that you know if people take a look at this uh, as a way potentially uh, to improve some of their experiences, with regard to the way that they you know, expect applications to run uh, or where they expect to use uh, their home operating system. Uh, it might be possible to get some of the people who have been on the fence about using Linux uh, over into Linux uh, and you know, participating in open source uh, because they'll have the confidence that while they're able to do things uh, on their you know, open source operating system, uh, that the games that they want and expect uh, from the high-end machine that they're using or you know the mid-end machine or whatever that they want to run games on those will still be there and that the experience will not be substantially different so today this is open source this is open source at libvf.io uh, we really welcome a lot of people to come and help us uh, with the open source aspect of this we really want contributions we want to work with vendors uh, we really really want to work with the guys uh, from intel who i personally believe are doing some of the most important work uh, in advancing this cause so the guys who are working on intel gbtg I, you know, you're doing a great job, really believe in what you're doing. Uh, and in the long run, my hope is that this technology will proliferate uh, across all the vendors and that the consumers ultimately will be the people, people to benefit. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, more or less uh, the talk. So thank you so much for giving us the time to listen uh, to what we have to say. Uh, and, you know, uh, you can reach me again on Twitter. It's uh, ArcVRArthur uh, on uh, Telegram at, uh, at Dopefish. Uh, and via email at uh, arthur at arcompute.com. So uh, thanks so much. And uh, please 
come check out our open source and uh, you know send us some pull requests, send us some uh, issues, uh, deploy our software, try it, tell if it, you know tell us if it's a good experience, tell us where the things are not working, um, and you know uh, participate in helping us build a community up around this. We're starting from a little group of guys who put some of this stuff together uh, for our own reasons. Um, uh, you know, I would really love the opportunity to uh, see if other people find value in this. And if there is value in this for other people, then maybe, uh, you know, getting some help with things and improving what can be improved and building up a community. So thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. You have an open source driver in Mesa for current generation hardware. You have machine readable documentation for that architecture in Mesa, and you're about to be certified conformant when the vendor of the hardware comes out and deprecates the architecture, releases a new architecture, and doesn't document it or release open source the drivers for it. What do you do? Well, you reverse engineer it, of course, but the vendor does give you one little secret. They tell you that there is operational equivalence between the instructions in the new architecture and the instructions in the old architecture. But wait, you had machine readable documentation for the old architecture, so there's no new reverse engineering needed. There's no new concepts, no new execution model. All you have to do is map the new encodings to the old encodings. This is certainly a tedious job. Uh, it'll take you a few months of work, but there's nothing conceptually impossible here. And more so, you have the potential to do incredible reverse engineering uh, in terms of the level of detail to go for perfect, not just good enough. You could even match the vendor syntax, uh, confuse them a little bit if you'd like. So great, you reverse engineer it, and what do you do? Well, you should release documentation for it, or write documentation for it. Uh, the vendor was clearly unable to, maybe they ran out of time, uh, maybe they didn't understand how important it is to release documentation for their hardware, but being the good uh, upstanding community member you are, you do the right thing and write documentation for it and publish it so everybody can understand the hardware, and uh, you're really helping out the vendor there with their, own, with their own hardware. What do you do after that? Well, it would be even better to have a disassembler and an assembler, both open source and upstream in Mesa. And again, being the great community member you are, you write those and upstream them. Um, the vendor will thank you profusely, I'm sure of it. From there, of course, you wanna have a full driver written, not just uh, some documentation. How do you manage that? Well, we know that there is this operational equivalence between the instructions on the old hardware and the instructions on the new hardware. And we already have a conformant compiler for the old hardware. So all we have to do is extend the old compiler to produce the new encodings. We can reuse all of the instruction selection and all of the optimization passes with very few changes. So that's all we need. And with, uh, so with another few weeks of effort, you can spin up a prototype uh, targeting the new hardware and upstream that code. And uh, before you know it, you have a Mesa driver upstream for this new hardware, uh, all open source, no mysteries, open documentation, and the hardware vendor only has you to thank for it. This is the story of the ARM Molly G78 with support coming into Mesa now. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I want to give you a quick overview about a project or an initiative uh, which is going on in uh, freedesktop.org related protocols. It's the input method hub, how it's called. And uh, the idea about it is to assess and document and think about uh, two protocols, which there are in Valent protocols the text input and the input method protocol. And their purpose is to control software composite text, as I would describe it. So it just means that instead of having like a physical keyboard to input text, you have some kind of software component. And if you look at the bottom, you have two examples for that, like a virtual keyboard, or for example, like an input method editor for, uh, yeah, often Asian languages needless for uh, having uh, 
to cover all the different characters that there are. So uh, there are already protocols for that in William protocols. Uh, asset, text input, and input method are the main ones. Uh, but there are different versions of these protocols. And actually, some protocol, uh, some projects use the protocols from feedersupport.org. Others have different versions of them. So there isn't yet a common standard for that. And uh, the input method hub wants to change that. And what is the input method hub? It's basically an issue ticket in the Wayland Protocols um, repository. So just to give you a quick view of that, I already opened it. So that is the issue ticket. And um, yeah, you can see here it's, um, yeah, here's the, first of all, some introduction and motivation for you to see, to understand what it is about. So uh, it's the issue ticket number 39, but you will find it as usual in GitLab. Um, there is a description of the challenges that there are, and uh, especially to give you an overview of what this stuff actually does. This uh, graphic I didn't include it in the presentation because you can see it here, and it basically means you have an input method provider on the one side, which is the client, and a text input, um, text input clients, which then receive this text which the input method uh, client sent. So, and uh, yeah, you have here some more description of the different protocols versions, which there are, right? So there are lots of different ones and here upstream and in downstream. And you have um, kind of a neat implementation matrix, I would say, because it shows you uh, which project currently implements which standard, right? So we have here uh, version one, version two, of input method, text input, right? There is even a, a rather obscure one, the Qt text input method protocol, which is only used by Qt. So the idea is to put this all together or share uh, or find a common ground to have then a final version of these protocols, which can be shared over all protocols. And yeah, that's what the ticket is for. And um, the current progress is that, uh, as I said, the ticket is there to provide an overview of the existing protocols. And we want to branch out uh, version 4 protocols, uh, which, uh, which already happened, right? There is a work branch for that in the valid protocols repository. And we want to collect requirements for the new protocols, right? There is, in, if you look in valid protocols number 39 issue, going back here into the related issues, right, or linked issues. Then you can find here, for example, a ticket which, uh, um, yeah, which tries to gather all the requirements which one side of the protocol needs. And there's a lot of feedback already, so it's quite good to see many people interested in that. So the current status, lots of feedback, but only from one side of the uh, protocol yet. So there's not so much uh, feedback yet from the text input side. So uh, that's something to look into more. But there is, interestingly, I noticed today a cute prototype for the next text input version, uh, which is which we are currently working on. So that would be then version four, right? Or the version which is currently uh, be, uh, being published on this next branch. So um, what needs to happen next? Uh, I think the, all this feedback needs to be assessed and documented uh, or, or gathered. And then uh, we need to find a, a scope for these new protocols and we need to create a protocol graph. And I think that could be done by a single document uh, developer if he works on that for one month. So that's maybe something to look into very next to push this initiative forward. So thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Ricardo Garcia. I work at Igalia, and today I'm going to talk about VKEXT MultiDraw. It's a Vulkan extension that was published this year, and as part of Igalia's collaboration with Valve, I had the chance to participate in its release process by reviewing the specification text in detail and providing feedback, and by creating a conformance tests for it in the VKGLCTS project. So, um, 
BKEXT multi-draw is an extension that was created to cover uh, a gap that existed between the OpenGL and Vulkan APIs. OpenGL has the multi-draw arrays and multi-draw elements draw calls, which didn't have an equivalent in Vulkan. So Mike Blumenkrantz, uh, working as a valve contractor, created the extension to be able to use it in sync and to ease implementing that part of OpenGL on top of Vulkan. Uh, but the extension can be useful for more people and situations, obviously. So with this extension, you can record uh, multiple draw calls without changing a state between each call uh, using a single function call. So it avoids the typical CPU overhead caused by checking common buffer state, which is draw call. In fact, if you're working on a Vulkan implementation, you can also use this extension as some kind of reference to improve the efficiency of a state checking in draw calls, for example. Um, the new APIs introduced by the extension are similar to the indirect family of draw calls, but, but uh, they don't need a GPU accessible memory. So they complement the existing set of draw calls nicely. Um, the extension adds a couple of uh, new draw calls. Uh, CMD draw multi is equivalent to calling uh, CMD draw multiple times in a row, and CMD draw multi index is the equivalent when using index buffers. Um, the mechanism is the same in both cases. Given the original draw common function, the extension extracts a couple of arguments to a multi draw information structure. Uh, these will be the draw parameters that will change in each uh, draw operation. You can store the, uh, an array of those structures in host memory and use that array with uh, the new multi-draw function by passing the number of them and a pointer to the array as arguments to the new function. Uh, then the common buffer, um, the instance count, and the first instance uh, arguments don't change between draw calls, and they have the same value they would have in the normal uh, draw command function. The remaining argument is a stride that indicates how many bytes to step over to find the next information structure in memory for each draw call. Uh, so normally it would have uh, would be the size of the uh, structure, but you can also use other values. So for example, if you use zero, you only need one structure, which is used over and over uh, draw count times. But you can also use, uh, you can also interleave information structures with other data in memory, and then use a bigger stride to jump over the extra data. Uh, the equivalent function with index buffers is pretty similar. Some arguments are um, moved to a structure. Uh, then you use an array of structures in host memory and pass the count and a pointer to, to the new function. And some other arguments don't change and would have the same value as in the non-multi case, which leaves a couple of arguments to be explained. So the stride is similar to the previous case and the vertex buffer, uh, sorry, the vertex offset pointer is optional and lets you specify, specify a, a constant value for the uh, vertex offset it if you know that parameter is going to have the same value in every structure in the array. Uh, this way you can, if you want, you can save some memory and you can also save some CPU in the application and in the driver. Uh, the extension had input from more people than the ones you see here, but I thought it was fair uh, to give at least a shout out to Mike, who created the extension and provided the implementations for Anvil and Red V, which I used when creating the uh, conformance tests. Jason from Intel, who was involved in since the beginning and reviewed the initial version of the specification, and also to Pierce Daniel from NVIDIA, who was involved early in Kronos and reviewed the specification and provided an implementation of the extension outside of MISA, which is uh, pretty cool, and I also used it when uh, writing the extension tests. And with this, uh, thanks for watching, and see you. Hello everyone, welcome to my Lightning Talk SDL, the quest for Wayland by default. As a really quick intro, I've been porting games for 10 years full time. My 68th game comes out at the end of the month, so if you want that wonderful golden number coming up next, please email me because that slot is in fact open. Uh, SDL is what my entire catalog uses, it's what pretty much every Linux game uses and what every big Linux game engine uses, so like Unity, Unreal, Source, Game Maker's IDE, just recently started using it. Uh, it's, it's hard to find a game that doesn't use it. Um, and so for SDL, 
Um, we actually default to X, which is no surprise to anyone. We've been using it for a very long time. Um, but what might be more of a surprise is that we actually have had Wayland support in SDL for quite a little while. Um, it just hasn't been considered production ready because there's lots of things we have to do. Um, and we have pretty much done all of those things, except there are a couple that are uh, still pretty major. Um, and we're going to go over those issues today. Uh, the big tracker that I sort of threw together in the form of a pull request is in that link. Uh, most of what we have left are, at this point are just bugs. So like keyword and text, there are a couple problems that uh, were just caused by me not knowing what I'm doing with XKB common or the text input protocol. So if you're familiar with either of those, you could probably jump in there and fix them in like a day. Um, there are some wishlist items, but they're not that big of a deal. So we're not considering the mission critical. Um, because really, when you actually go and run a game with SDL with Wayland enabled, you'll find the experience pretty much feels complete at this point. Um, we have client-side decorations, finally. Uh, we have full-screen toggling working, high DPI works, inputs pretty much there. Um, with a recent desktop and a recent SDL, um, it feels pretty darn good. Except when it doesn't. So we have basically the two major blockers and the first one you can see right here um the first blocker is uh oak Pay presentation because as it turns out a lot of games mine included uh use alpha in the back buffer um because we actually do use the alpha channel internally but we just weren't expecting that compositors might actually use the alpha channel as transparent crazy right alpha is transparency yeah didn't see that coming um but problem is there are lots of games that use this and not all of them are going to get updated so we need something in SDL that lets us kind of preserve original behavior because we don't want we don't want to tell Wayland to not do transparent rendering because you know that's there are genuine reasons to actually support that so in this case we saw that in Vulkan there's already something that basically fixes this uh, but there isn't an EGL version so we just decided to make an extension and by we, I mean Eric, because Eric designed, documented, implemented basically everything. So thank you to Eric for basically doing all the work on this. Um, but yeah, it's in the EGL registry. SDL uses it. NVIDIA's acknowledged it, so it'll be in a driver at some point. Um, the Mace implementation is done, um, but we don't have a test. There's an SDL sample that has a, acts as a test, but it's not, as far as I know, it's not sufficient for CI. I could be wrong on that. Um, but if you like making test programs, go to that link. Um, uh, we could really use a test because then it can go in the next Mace release. Uh, less finished is the other blocker, which is surface suspension. Because basically what happens is when a window isn't visible, the compositor has all the permission in the world to block presentation and stall the program forever. Which, from an energy efficiency standpoint, kind of makes sense because like regular applications using like GTK or Qt or whatever probably don't care. Um, but games absolutely do not tolerate being stalled for any reason whatsoever. Like, absolutely zero tolerance. Um, I could go on for a whole hour about why this doesn't work and why there's no way around it. Just know that it doesn't work and we need a way around it. Um, my original idea when I first found this bug was, well, let's do swap buffers with timeout. Like, once again, just going back to Vulkan, which has timeout and presentation, let's just rip that off and make an EGL extension. Um, the problem is that, I mean, other than design, like the design isn't that hard, but actually fixing it in the back catalog for all applications, as well as getting Vulkan to use it, because it turns out nobody in the Vulkan world uses timeout, um, as it turns out. Uh, basically, there's like a lot of reasons why, even though this is a decent idea, um, in practice, it wouldn't actually fix the catalog very well. Um, unlike the other thing, which definitely would do a lot better, is something that Joshua Ashton from the DXVK team kind of came up with, which is a protocol. Uh, it doesn't really change behavior in any way. It just tells the applications what the compositor is doing. So when the, a window service is suspended, it just fires an event saying, yes, we're suspended. And when it's back, it fires an event saying, OK, now it's not suspended. It's a very simple little protocol. Um, it's very easy to integrate. Like SDL already has a patch. EGL and Vulkan have prototypes that work. Um, and we have, you know, a prototype on the server side too, which is great. Um, problem is the spec wording, it hasn't been finished yet. Like there's a lot of review going on there. There are a lot of questions about presentation implementations. So like what to do, like, so should we keep the frame? Should we queue them? Should we just drop them entirely and expect that the application will redraw when it's unsuspended? Like there's a lot of 
very particular details about an extension that really is simple, but there's a lot of scary questions. And smart people are talking about this now, so if you go to that link, you can look at the discussion. Um, I really would like for this to be wrapped up soon because this is probably the most serious bug by far. Um, and we need this to be fixed for Wayland to be the default in SQL. Like, it's pretty much non-negotiable. So I'm probably over time. I don't know because I don't have a clock. Uh, but basically, go to these links if you want to follow me, ask me questions, sponsor me, hire me, all that stuff. Uh, do whatever you want. Thanks for your time and have a wonderful XTC. Thanks, everybody.